I'll start my semi-introduction um, so that Michael can have more time to talk. Um, so uh, Dr. Michael Moreno's Global Talk series is entitled The East-West City, Constructing 21st Century Identities in Global Cities. Uh, using literary lens, this presentation examines how key cities throughout the world are becoming spatial intersections where Eastern and Western ways of knowing, perceiving, and being are crisscrossing and generating unique East-West identities. Uh, Michael Moreno has been an English professor at Green River College since 2008 and teaches research, writing, and literature courses here. We actually got tenure together. Um, he is a co-chair of the Instructional Diversity Committee and fa uh, faculty facilitator of the Netherlands-Scotland Study Abroad Program, so apply to that program. He will bring you to Europe. Uh, Michael holds an MA in World and Comparative Literature from San Francisco State University, focused in Turkish-German literature and North American-Asian literature, as well as an MA in English focused on American ethnic and liter literature and culture, and a PhD in English focused in Latinx culture and uh, literature and culture in the 20th and 21st century American literature and spatial theory, which is suburban uh, studies, architectural theory, and human geography. Global talk. <laughs> both from the University of California, Riverside. His publications, which concentrate on ethnic and city identity constructions in culture and literature, include Term Paper Research Guide to Latino History, Book Chapters in Narratives of Place in Literature and Film, Strange Phenomena, Time, The City, and Liter Literary Imagination, We Wear the Mask, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and Representation of Black Identity, Speaking Desde las Heridas, Ciber uh, Testimonios Transfronteriz Fronterizos, Transborder, September 11th, 2011 uh, through 2007, uh, and Real History, Studies in American Film, as well as Scholarly Journal Articles in Otherness and Urban Reconstruction, Studies in Contemporary Culture, Iowa Journal of Cultural Studies, Journal X, a Journal in Culture and Criticism, and British Association for American Studies Journal. So we're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Moreno uh, speaking with us today about global issues in the East-West City. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Um, so this will be a very interesting talk in terms of how it's going to unfold itself. Um, in trying to construct the identity of the East-West City, and I'll talk about what that means, one thing I think will be important to keep in mind is that these definitions, these um, structures that we create to define things, um, they're in perpetual flux. <clears throat> so oftentimes it makes it difficult to pinpoint or isolate or turn something into a static design for us to examine, for us to fully articulate, because they're constantly transforming. But there are ways to study these things, there are ways to articulate these things that capture this constant movement as well, right? The evolving definitions that can occur. <clears throat> Let's see if I can remember how to use this one. Here we go. So very quickly, uh, and again, these are also loose definitions that I use. Um, for the east-west city, in terms of the way I've examined it so far, um, I kind of create these two loose categories of what I mean by the east. Uh, First, we have uh, Islamic East, which comprises uh, sort of a latitudinal East across the globe. So you'll see center point right there, there is uh, Israel. There we go. Israel right in the very middle. It's not working up here. In the red, which is a very, more or less a, a cultural intersection politically, historically, in and of itself. It's own kind of identity that's going on there as well. The other, uh, the other East that I sort of loosely try to pinpoint is the longitudinal east, going uh, up and down, as it were. So this will comprise the Pacific Islands, uh, Japan, Korea, China, the, uh, uh, essentially the East Asia, Southeast Asia, even going down to Australia and New Zealand in terms of those uh, areas, and those cities too, because of migratory uh, patterns and whatnot, bringing people to these different locations. So for the purposes of this presentation, east essentially is referring to these regions, right, when I mean the East itself. Um, oftentimes in the West, in order to define things and compartmental thing, compartmentalize things, we create these binaries. Um, us versus them, East versus West, North versus South. It becomes easy for us in the West to define things when we establish a taxonomy and sort of break things apart separate them, and is examine them in very isolated pockets. It's very true with East and West as well. 
historically, East and West has always been discussed in the West as a point of division, right? As a dichotomous relationship. Hence, even in the optics that you can see, the slash between East and West is showing a division between the two. In terms of optics, I'm looking at East and West as a site of exchange, that there's actually fluidity that goes between these elements, that they're not actually two divided spaces, but when they actually come to spaces where they are combined, they are forming something entirely new. Right? My approach to this idea comes out of border theory, where oftentimes the border itself is the line drawn between sovereign nations, walls that are created to establish the us versus them, wherever it might be. These can be physical, geographical walls. They can be ideological walls. They can be um, psychological walls, even interior walls that we create ourselves to. But in recognizing that the border itself is a very fluid space of exchange, right? Between the United States and Mexico, particularly, uh, certainly uh, the cities that are border those, those regions, um, Ciudad Juarez with El Paso on the other side, this is an example of where all things can actually move through it. Right? The only line that really exists is a political line that's drawn. And it's very arbitrary. Because even that border between the United States and Mexico, when it was first created after the Mexican-American War in the mid-19th uh, mid century, part of that was used, uh, part of the line of demarcation was a river. Uh, the Rio Bravo, Rio Grande. And so, of course, if you know anything about rivers, they are constantly in flux. And definitely that created a problem geographically between the border, uh, part of the border between the United States and Mexico, when that river would move. But aside from that, too, within the space of a border, a dynamic area, a dynamic experience is generated. This is a place where you have an amalgamation of cultures coming together, right? Gloria Anzaldúa says that the border itself is where people of different races can occupy the same territory, where under, lower, middle, and upper classes touch, where the space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy. So the border, in many respects, creates a third space, right? It's not a division between one side or the other anymore. It actually creates a space unto itself, something that is different a different space, an other space, outside of the normal structures of spaces themselves. Viramontes also writes about the border uh, is something that you actually bring with you in a transmigratory process as well. And so the memories that you have, uh, the psychological experience of the culture, of the border itself, is actually something that you bring with you when you move physically to other locations. So again, the border is not static. It is not geographically static. It is constantly in motion. And that becomes the imperative thing in trying to understand a space like that. So again, within that other space, new agencies can be generated. Right? New ways of seeing, new ways of knowing, new ways of articulating identities can be constructed within that kind of space. So I see the space also extending out to the way that we can conceptualize east and west the same time, right? Um, the city itself is a great uh, canvas because it, com it is a composition, essentially, of multicultures already, right? And again, it's not a utopia, and it's not necessarily a dystopia. It is an other space, a different space, which I'll push towards in a, in a minute. So the cityscape provides this opportunity for creativity, but for regenerating culture at the same time, reconfiguring culture as it mixes, as it interacts, as it clashes with other cultures too at the same time. All right. As a frontier site, the border also operates as a place for communication and exchange. Frontiers, frontiers are places of separation and articulation, modes of joining. They create opportunities for recalibrating elements that are in there. Right? Reconfiguring them, redefining them, in a perpetual state of constantly redefining. This creates motion and it creates growth, so the space does not remain stagnant. There's also a creative process that's involved in this at the same time. New identities can be generated through various modes of expression. So definitely a site like this, uh, an east a city, a border, can operate in a postmodern atmosphere, 
right? It's very postmodern. It has the, the elements of postmodernity. It is comprised of fragments that are in perpetual transformation, as I said. Identities that are fragmented as they move across various borders, both real and imagined. Communities that do the same as well. This creates a perpetual crisscrossing back and forth, right? Or it could include more than one space at the same time. The mobility and the motion is essential in really trying to understand how this is operating. Begin to think of a kaleidoscope. I think this is probably the greatest analogy for the kinds of spaces I'm talking about. You look through a kaleidoscope and you move it. Different shapes and colors, depending on the trajectory of the light, will come through it. And you'll see new images constantly, right? The pieces, the elements, the fragments that are there are constantly moving and changing. Some are coexisting with each other momentarily. Some are colliding and then altering that trajectory somewhere else and forming something else. Right? They're also coalescing at the same time. Right? The movement allows for that. This is exactly what is occurring within an east-west city. Same thing that occurs within the border, using border theory. So the overlapping and the, the cross-translation of worlds becomes essential. Because not only are languages overlapping, but ideologies, epistemologies, different ways of knowing, ontologies, different ways of being and conceptualizing your existence are now encountering other forms as well. With their roots in the East and the West, which there's looseness to that as well. <clears throat> so because of my own academic training, um, I use literature as a tool for actually being able to identify this phenomenon that's occurring, of what I see occurring in various cities around the world right now. Right? Literature, I think, actually is um, an excellent tool to use because it has certain freedoms that other academic disciplines do not necessarily allow for. Right? Literature, particularly world literature itself, moves us through time and space while creating these overlapping layers, which can be viewed simultaneously. Right? You see contradictory things happening at the same time. Right? The opposites that seem to be opposite are, in fact, one and the same. So again, it's a third space that's being generated. It's not that you see east and you see west, or you go back and forth between the two. What you're actually seeing is an overlapping of these elements at the same time that creates something entirely new. Through language, through various aspects of culture, through the use of memory as well, right? And this essentially can play with our notion of time and space at the same time, which I'll, I'll elaborate on. So at the same time that it's doing this, it dissolves those binary constructions, right? It's no longer east versus west. It is no longer this ideology versus this ideology. The binaries that have been set up, particularly in the west, and that taxonomy of of compartmentalization that occurs, where you divide things and you separate them and you examine them and define them in a very static environment. That is dissolved because it does not really exist. Since it is imposed, that sort of reading of binary constructions is a way to impose a reading on a community, on an idea, on a place, on an experience. Okay? <clears throat> so the east-west city itself through works of literature, through what writers are doing, who are living in both worlds simultaneously, bringing both worlds with them as they are moving physically and moving uh, in their minds through the works of literature. That is occurring. Transgressing borders, it challenges hierarchies, which is the essential part as well, especially when the writer is in a position of marginalization. It becomes a new way to actually generate agency to challenge the existing hierarchies, to dismantle them as well, because they are simply human constructions at the same time. What literature will do is, even within the narrative itself, it will reveal this experience, these worlds, as microcosms. You can, be, you can look at a scene of a person sitting in a cafe versus a character moving through a plaza, whatever it might be. And at that time, at that moment, so many things are going through the character's mind what the character sees and experiences. Even though spaces may seem identical and the same, recognize that not every body, every person that moves through that space experiences it identically. 
very quick example would be the 7-Eleven. Not everybody who walks into a 7-Eleven at 9.30, 8 o'clock, 9.30, will experience that 7-Eleven quite the same way, right? Because of the way your body will be read, right? How people read your body, predicated on gender constructions or assumptions, sexual orientation constructions and assumptions, ethnic, racial, socioeconomic class, all of these things get placed upon your body as a text, and it's read that way. And so you're just walking into a 7-Eleven, but your experience can be completely different from someone else walking into that same space. We can see this most clearly through works of literature, because one of the primary functions of literature, as with any human expression, whether it's music, architecture, theater, dance, everything, any form of human expression articulates a language, a transforming language that teaches us what it essentially means to be a human being, right? And not necessarily fully universal because all people have different experiences too. So it can articulate cultural identities at the same time. So even within that small reading of a space in the body of the novel, you'll, you're able to see that, right? Portals through portals, doors through doors, windows through windows, right? Something more three-dimensional. So again, creating a different place, creating an other space, these multiple fragments of your identity, of collective identities coming together in one place, what exactly could that possibly be? Right? It's the heterotopia. Right? Breaking that word down, hetero, different, other, place. Unlike the dystopia or the utopia, which don't necessarily exist, a heterotopia is both real and it is both imagined simultaneously. Remember, all binaries break down within a space like this. And this is Michel Foucault's theory, this idea of that possibility. The space like this actually has that possibility. So let me take you through a couple of layers of real and imagined places. Um, the heterotopia juxtaposes numerous, seemingly incompatible spaces into one place. A movie theater, right? You're sitting there watching a film at a movie theater, if we still do that now. There's various forms that we can interact with things now, which actually is very important in terms of the way our space is transformed. Within a movie theater, you're engaged within the film, the characters draw you in just like a book would, just like a work of art would, just like any kind of human expression that you're uh, involved with or experiencing will do that. It changes that space right there. And oftentimes you'll see movie directors who will play with the conventions of film to either break the fourth wall and come right at you, right? Or play with linear narratives and create them, create non-linear ones as well. A garden can be the same thing as well. You create the space with all of these imported elements, all these different elements that are in there simultaneously, right? A coexistence, a clash, even a coalescence of elements. There's also a layering, particularly with time. Library, the festival, the palimpsest. Um, heterotopia is most effective when it distorts conventional experiences of time, okay? Think of a freeway as well. This can also be a, a form of it, a momentary heterotopia. This is an opportunity where your experience on a freeway moving down it isolates you, puts you in a very different space from the cities around you, the spaces around you. You can basically fly down a freeway, you may see the cityscape pass by, you may see exit signs, but you have no real interaction with that space. Your notion of time is transformed at the same, in the same token as well. Right? what it would take to actually walk through those spaces and interact with them is very different when you accelerate time. So even within a library itself, too, where you have an amalgamation of different texts that are there, different books, different ideas and concepts, all housed in one location, this dem all throughout time as well, it demonstrates a break with that time, an accumulation of time. 
a festival. A festival can be in an open field, in an open street in one moment, and suddenly on another day, you have a large carnival, and it completely transforms that space momentarily, a fleeting element of space. So time itself, as a human construction, also breaks down, right? We have that ability to move from the past into the present quite easily, with great fluidity. The in-between spaces are also extraordinary. When you're in a cemetery as well, you're in that sort of liminal in-between space. You know, there's that life, there's that death. You walk around and you observe the tombstones, you read the names, you think of the lives that these individuals have had, you look at the dates on them as well. And that notion of time seems to be very disrupted, right? The mystery is there. It's there, they're there, but they're not quite there. Where are you exactly as well in this sort of isolated space? Uh, the mirror, another one as well, you see your reflection. Obviously that's not you, but it is you at the same time. And when you start to gather multiple mirrors, you have multiple ways of seeing, multiple ways of viewing as well. It can be a metaphor, but it can actually be a physical thing at the same time. There are multiple elements simultaneously existing. Um, last one, I know I should probably move on. Here I go babbling away. The palimpsest, which is a, a, a unique uh, experience in terms of uh, city design. Um, very quickly, a palimpsest would be, for example, if you were writing something on a piece of paper and you suddenly erased it to rewrite something else. But part of what you originally transcribed is still there. It's still somewhat visible. That's the palimpsest, right? You see that in cities as well, particularly older cities that have gone through design and architectural transformations, spatial transformations. You see part of that old element of the city still remaining, right? And if you know what that is, you can chart the city's progression and transformation. There's a, a moment where you're standing in between worlds. And a lot of the older cities around the world, when you go there, you can see that as well, where they overlap with each other. I mention these things because these are things that come out of the works of literature. And I'll go over a couple of uh, writers who are actually doing this and look at a couple of scenes to show you how this space is being generated, that it, uh, how it transforms. So um, every good English professor should have a thesis statement. And uh, I'm proposing this here at the very beginning, a lot of the ideas I'm talking about. And I'll prove them with uh, examples from different writers, different world writers as well, and looking at a couple of close scenes of what they generate. So um, very dense, because it is the thesis statement itself. But I'll break this down for us with my examples. So an east-west city is a postmodern site in constant flux and fluidity in which global ways of knowing can be perceived in a matrix of disruptive interchanges and crisscrossings. Okay? It is a third space. The east-west city is a third space, a heterotopic space, where cultures and languages and the ways that identities are constructed, geopolitical definitions, the way that those are generated, um, perspectives, and subjectivities. This is a space where these things can simultaneously coexist, collide, collide is this, right? Co or coalesce. And it's not a linear thing. These things are happening all at once. There isn't a beginning or an end to it as well. So such a space like this is a way to actually become innovative and to create new ways of thinking to shift the paradigm in the way we conceptualize our relationship to space and place as well as our relationship to time and actually create forms of agency, right? Forms of power as well, right? It is a way of de or dismantling structures of hierarchy and hegemonic structures as well, as we'll see. Recalibrating these other spaces. So, uh, first writer that I have here is um, Xiaolu Gu. She is a Chinese-British writer. And I'm not expecting you to, to read all of that. I'm going to kind of just basically say what that says. So I always tell my students, never make your PowerPoint slides text-heavy because no one's going to sit there and stare at that. So I'll read these things and I'll, I'll explain what they are. So each of the writers I've discovered will look at the east-west city, depending on where it is. Uh, Xiaolu Gu. Uh, uses Beijing and she uses London, right? Her novels will crisscross between the two. 
Uh, they'll stay within one city in and of itself, but it will show some of the east-west elements that she brings to it. So for Gu, the east-west element that characterizes her writing is the yin-yang. Okay? And again, this is not a binary element. Right? This is about creating these what seem to be antipodal elements um, on the opposite ends of elements, bringing them together to form a sense of harmony so that energy, chi, is able to continuously flow, right? In a nutshell, essentially what it is. Harmony and disorder are conceived through contiguity and distance. And finding harmony depends on combining and contrasting elements into these different relations of contiguity. Harmony is ultimately a matter of integration, of bringing these elements together, right? So for Gu, in her writing, the idea of bringing Eastern ways of thinking and behavior and the way she was raised and confronting Western elements of that, for her there's a possibility of crossing these things over. Right? Not always harmoniously, but the desire is to create a balance within herself, a balance between these two worlds. Right? That becomes essential for her. Um, this particular scene is out of, uh, out of uh, this first book here. She. Uh, a concise Chinese English dictionary. Uh, the way that she constructs this book, it is like a dictionary. She provides definitions of different words that she's learning. The protagonist in that novel is studying in London. Her parents send her over there. She uh, is from China, Beijing, right outside of Beijing. So she's learning English, and she's also learning Western culture at the same time. Right? So she's confronted with all kinds of new things. And in the very beginning, even the language in which Gu writes it in is very, very fragmented and very, very broken. But the more she learns, the English actually improves more. She begins to master that. She begins to master ways of Western thinking as she's confronted with paradoxical things, assumptions that she's made about the West before and what she actually sees. She finds herself um, a boyfriend while she's there. She moves in with her, or moves in with him. Um, breaks some of the taboos that her family had established for her. But in this one scene, she's in a garden, Kew Gardens, and she's with her boyfriend. And um, they're moving through it, and Kew Gardens is an amazing garden. It has uh, vegetation, trees, life from all around the world. A lot of the former colonies of the British Empire as well are represented. And so the entire garden is set up in such a way to basically showcase the Western arrangement of the rest of the world right there. So she finds out that there is a, um, a Chinese garden that is located in there. So she wants to see it. But essentially, she is shocked to see that a lot of these things are mismatched in terms of how they're identified. It shows a real lack of knowledge of what actually goes into a Chinese garden, mixing it up with other countries. And so for her, she's angry. You know, she can't believe that they don't have that full representation. Whereas the Westerner would walk through and look at it and go, oh, okay, that's a Chinese garden, even though it really is not. She's able to point that out to her boyfriend, which allows her, just even a momentary element, to critique that Western space, to bring these two worlds together, right, in a way of harmonizing. So she spends her time trying to constantly create that balance between the two worlds in the spaces that she moves through, in the ideas that she's generating. Not trying to become more east or less west or more west and less east, but she realizes that there's this third element right in between that she can't quite put her finger on. And it's happening there in that London space. Um, let, me, let me move on. So uh, Lila Abulela is a uh, Sudanese writer. She's uh, spends a great deal of time in Great Britain, uh, England, and Scotland. And so for Abu Lela, a lot of her writing critiques the way that Islam is perceived in the West. Right? There is the belief that um, you know, a woman who wears hijab is, needs to be rescued by the West. And so she wants to basically create a different image of the West. Because a lot of Eastern writers, um, culturally Muslim writers who are in the West, have written novels, have written various tracts that basically will critique Islam. 
And so she wants to bring a different kind of voice, a different way of merging East and West. And so she's able to do that through her work. Her, her uh, method of creating the heterotopia is through translations. Right? One of her characters is a translator. And uh, she goes from Khartoum in the Sudan to um, Aberdeen, Scotland. And she works at one of the universities there. And she's in the process of translating Arabic into English. She's also confronted with the fact that she is completely outside of her realm. And yet she still senses and sees her own city within this new Western city that she's experienced. And so um, one thing that Abu Lala does within that space where the West and the East seem to clash and collide, she tries to generate a new identity, one that's empowering as well, one that allows her to define the Muslim woman. So in this reading here, this Samara is the translator, and um, she's walking through the streets of Aberdeen. Outside, Samara stepped into a hallucination, which the world had swung around. Home had come here. Its dimly lit streets, its sky, and the feel of home had come here and balanced just for her. But this was Scotland, and the reality left her dulled, unsure of herself. This had happened before, but not for so long, not so deeply. Sometimes the shadow in the dark, referring to Aberdeen in Scotland, uh, sometimes the shadow in a dark room would remind her of the power cuts in Khartoum, or she would mistake the gurgle of the central heating pipes for a distant azan, which is the call to prayers. But she had never stepped into a vision before. Home had never come here before. And so, even though it is in a memory as well, she superimposes her city, her eastern city, into this western city. The two become united. The two become one. Right? And there's melancholy. There's nostalgia that's connected with that. But it's also a process for her of reconfiguring the space that she is now in. Rather than completely just isolating herself in the east or trying to undo all of that, relinquish her eastern identity and become westernized, as the expectation would be for devout Muslim women, oftentimes in the west. She's bringing these two worlds together. And so the very spaces themselves will actually generate these memories. The very spaces themselves will cross these worlds over. Uh, another writer here. This is a, a Turkish writer, um, Orhan Pamuk. He um, he's wrote a series of books, won the Nobel Prize in 2006. He focuses on Istanbul. Here is another east-west city. There between Asia and Europe, the Bosphorus River that crosses the two, uh, that cuts through the two. One part of the city you're in Asia, the other part of the city you're in Europe. And so this city has had a history for uh, countless centuries of constantly vacillating between the East and the West. But rather than going one direction or the other constantly, it actually is a third space. So the kind of heterotopia that Pamuk sees in Istanbul is something called the Huzum. This is the melancholy, the nostalgia that is experienced uh, by uh, Istanbulas, the people of Istanbul, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. At the close of World War I, when the entire <clears throat> Ottoman Empire was carved up by the uh, conquering powers, the Western colonial powers. Uh, Istanbul itself was in a very dark state. And so probably not until the night, early 1920s when Ataturk comes to power and tries to regenerate the city, or bring it back to life. Of course, he pushed it more towards Western culture as well. So this city goes back and forth between these. But the Huzun itself, is the experience of losing that empire. Of once being a world-dominating empire, now it is in the past. And as Pamuk moves through the city and through the various novels that he's generated, as he moves through these spaces, he can see these palimpsests, right? These former elements of the original city in its heyday. The old mansions along the riverside uh, who were occupied by various uh, royal dignitaries under the Sultan. And so the past is still present within the city. Even though the city continues to grow and regenerate itself, both of these worlds are there. But one thing that Pamuk is able to do that not all Istanbulas are able to do all the time 
is to use that huzun, that deep set melancholy, that loss, that nostalgia, to actually generate agency, to generate creativity, to actually demonstrate how the city itself is its own east-west space. And so, um, again, various novels that he's constructed will abolish you know, uh, any, any, connota any connotations to fixed time and space, because his novels will move in and out of history as well. And so, again, by releasing ourselves from a linear timeline and a direct spatial area, you're kind of floating in many cases. But there is the possibility of generating a different kind of identity, one with positive agency. That's there, too. Um, let, me, let me move to our last writer here. So um, Murakami, a uh, famous writer in Tokyo, uh, writes a lot about Tokyo, other areas as well. Uh, anybody heard of Murakami's work before? Yeah. Um, I end with this one because in terms of the way that the heterotopia works, I think that many things, uh, even outside of literature, many things are moving in this kind of direction. So Murakami uh, uses the simulacra, or the simulacrum is the singular, and I'll explain what that is in a second. But his novels um, <clears throat> cross genres. Um, the, one, the, the particular one that I focused on is, uh, is called After Dark. And this is about Tokyo at night in the entertainment districts, Shibuya, maybe a couple of other areas as well. Right? The idea is that the night conceals things. But in fact, what happens in the novel itself is the night actually reveals things. During the day, people are stuck in a routine. Uh, Japan is a highly accelerated culture within that city itself. Uh, it's a very rigid and strict one, but when the sun goes down, things transform. The city itself is also alive with all kinds of stimulation, right? visual stimulation, um, sensory, all sensory stimulation. Now, with the stimulation, oftentimes the stimulation itself can become the real thing. So again, we're back to this idea of the real and the imagined crossing over and blurring. The simulacrum is any object, any thing itself that has been simulated. Right? If you think of virtual reality games and all of those elements, there's a simulation of those. However, what Baudrillard argues is that it's not just the simulation that is a big deal. It's that the simulation has now replaced the original, that the original no longer makes any difference. It's no longer relevant. So the line of demarcation between what is real and what is not real, that line is very blurred if it's there at all anymore. So within the city itself, the city itself becomes alive with all kinds of elements occurring simultaneously. Uh, this is the establishing shot. Murakami is very filmic in the way he actually writes uh, his novels. So when you're reading them, it's uh, though you're actually watching a film at the same time. It's his desire to cross over these genres and also to play with notions of time and space at the same time. So in this establishing shot, here's an image of Tokyo itself, uh, he makes a parallel with um, the body, with uh, the physiology of human beings at the same time. In our broad sweep, the city, the city of Tokyo, looks like a single gigantic creature, or more like a single collective entity created by many intertwining organisms. Countless arteries stretch to the ends of its elusive body, circulating a continuous supply of fresh blood cells, sending out new data, collecting the old, sending out new consumables and collecting the old, sending out new contradictions and collecting the old. The rhythm of its pulsing, all part of the body, flicker and flare and squirm, again like a kaleidoscope. It's a perfect heterotopia because you have so many different elements that are occurring, so many different individuals, so many different experiences occurring simultaneously within the uh, strictures of Tokyo, that you have the coexistence, you have the collision, and you have the coalescence simultaneously taking place. And so the night offers an opportunity for people to actually uh, unsheathe the strictures of daytime life. Uh, 
during the Edo period of Tokyo, or Edo precedes the name Tokyo itself, the entertainment districts would do this. Um, the, uh, the life of the shogun, particularly under the emperor, uh, could be very monotonous, especially now that you weren't necessarily fighting in the wars, you were rewarded. And so you took on bureaucratic titles and elements and activities. And so all of society within Tokyo in this period, of course, is highly structured, highly strict. There is no mobility between any of the class systems, between any of the groups. However, within the Sakariba, this became a space where people from other groups, from other areas within the city could gather. Essentially, it was a place where there were kabuki theaters, there were wrestling matches, um, there were brothels, there were tea houses. But it was a moment where you could be a merchant and you could sit down with, say, with a samurai and talk about ideas that you had, talk about ways of making things efficient or whatever it was. In any other capacity, you would never be able to talk on that level. Okay? So again, it creates this kind of space outside of the normal space, a different space, an other space that would allow for these interchanges and these interactions to occur. And again, this is also what happens in the novel After Dark, where you have this, you know, this bizarre array of characters suddenly confronting each other and meeting each other in a tennis cafe, in a park that's set up to uh, play with cats in the middle of the night, in a brothel or a love hotel, technically, as it's called. All of these different places where these characters are able to encounter each other. But woven within the narrative, too, <clears throat> are all of these Western references Murakami, um, who used to run the, I think it was called the Peter Cat uh, Jazz Bar in Tokyo uh, for a while, um, big, big fan of jazz music and music in general, particularly from the West, integrates songs into the uh, narrative itself. They'll hear it playing in the Denny's and they'll reference it. Someone will sing it, a character will make a reference to it. Other references will be film, uh, pop cultural references, art. So at first you're thinking, well, he's just name dropping all of these things and throwing them in there, and the characters seem to know that. But actually, if you begin to look at that song, the lyrics of that song like a poem, or you look at the artwork that someone's referring to, or even a book or a film that they're referring to, the characters in the novel, if you actually go deeper into it, you can see that there's another layer to what's going on in that scene. So he provides these different portals, these almost trap doors. If you perceive them, you, ac you can actually go through them finding out more about them, and you see another layer to the characters or even what is happening in that scene. So again, it operates on that level of an other space, a different space. And um, this entertainment district is a perfect example of a heterotopic space, uh, the floating world itself. Here's Murakami's description of that floating world as it is today. They call this place an amusement district. The giant digital screens fastened, uh, fastened to the sides of buildings fall silent as midnight approaches, but loudspeakers on storefronts keep pumping out exaggerated hip-hop bass lines. A large game center crammed with young people, wild electronic sounds, a group of college students spilling out from a bar, teenage girls in brilliant beached hair, healthy legs thrusting out from micro miniskirts, dark suited men racing diagonal crosswalks for the last trains to the sub, uh, suburbs. The district plays by its own rules at a time like this. So even in that space of night, the ability to suspend time and also to transform spaces becomes more prevalent and more powerful in that kind of a world, in that kind of an atmosphere that is gener generated by all sorts of unbelievable, surreal, uh, simulations and stimulations, these things become far more significant than the actual real thing that it's simulating. Right? So I, I ended with Murakami because I also believe that the further and the deeper we go into the 21st century, that line of distinction between what is real and what is not real, between our relationship to time and to space, is in a perpetual transformation. And those lines that are there are blurring. In fact, I think they never really existed. In fact, I think it's what the heterotopia is that you're experiencing. So, to close, again, um, 
the east-west city itself, at least at this stage and how I'm, I'm looking at it and what I've been working on, this really is truly a heterotopic space. In fact, you can have heterotopias within the city itself, uh, a, an armature of heterotopias, right? A collection, a constellation of heterotopias all operating simultaneously. It's an opportunity for not just the characters, but the writers who are generating these spaces through literature. It's an opportunity to actually reconfigure agency, to rearticulate identity at the same time. Perpetually transmigratory in non-linear ways that disrupts the time frame as well. It allows for memory to integrate itself into the narrative and recalibrating other spaces. So I know that's a lot. And you probably, and it's OK, you probably tuned me in and out, maybe more tuned out than tuned in, um, which is fine. And it's actually very telling because, again, it also demonstrates, even though we're sitting here in the same space, you're actually moving in other places too, right? Maybe you're looking outside, and you're like, oh, the sun's still out there, or you're thinking about this that you have to take care of, and you're visualizing how you need to do that. I said something that triggered a different kind of memory, and you kind of follow that down the rabbit hole as well, right? The way you're thinking is not linear at all, right? So the way that these spaces are constructed that we actually inhabit, they are not linear. They're very heterotopic. And again, the best way I've been able to see to detect these heterotopic spaces, to look at the east-west city, the way it's generated, the way it's formed, the way it changes, is as the heterotopia, right? And it is through the works of literature that, at least for me, I am most easily able to see those things because the writers themselves are creating east-west identities and they too are getting in touch with this new way, these different worlds coming together all at once. I doubt any of these writers would consider himself or herself, herself an east-west writer. In fact, I think um, even Shalu Gu said that, no, I'm not an East-West. You know, I'm not East-West, even though everything she does is East-West. Right? So it doesn't really matter whether or not the writer identifies that way or not. It is a phenomenon that is occurring. And again, literature is one way to articulate that kind of East-West space that you see. But the mass migrations that are going on, uh, the mass movements that are going on from one area to another, from the rural districts into the city itself and to other cities, you see a lot of the transformation, but you don't see a lot of the time to process what's actually happening. And I think that the literature at least allows us to slow down and fully articulate how those identities are being constructed and the different possibilities, the different ways that can be done. And again, I know I threw a lot of really bizarre theory out at you as well, Obviously, I can't expect everyone to get it in one sitting, naturally. But there is the idea that there are those possibilities that are created in an other space, in a different space, outside of the strictures of binary, uh, uh, binary oppositions. So in ending, I'm taking a look right now at various other cities. The list, of course, continues on this. As legitimate east-west cities, and I, I start with the literature itself, and the writers who are crossing between these cities, uh, either within the city itself or from their city to a western city, bridging those things together through the works of literature. So anyway, I will stop. So thank you for your time. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. So if you have any questions for Dr. Moreno, Maricela. Yeah. Oh, I, I speak loud. Yeah. Um, so I, I was wondering what you think, um, if you think that there is a political connotation to this understanding of cities, spaces, uh, as places of heterotopia or under the lens of heterotopia. Uh, so in terms of the, the politics of these spaces? Um, or, or the politics that are created um, when looking at these spaces, sure. right, would, would, would that politic be impacted by this understanding of these spaces as heterotopic spaces? Yeah, I think that um, it can't, the politics can play a condition in moving people around as well and even changing things within a city itself. So wars, for example, will move people out of the area. 
Um, bad economic decisions that are made will also move people out of the area as well, other opportunities. So in terms of a political connection, I think that politics can help inadvertently generate these heterotopic spaces. Um, again, the heterotopic space isn't just sitting there waiting to be found. It is something that is, is created as well. It's both there and it's not quite there. It's, it reminds me of Borges's uh, Aleph. It's exactly that, if you've read um, uh, Jorge Luis uh, Borges's The Aleph. Uh, it's an amazing short story, but it's a great example of that kind of amalgamation of all things where both space and time are utterly disrupted. So it is a perspective, without a doubt, because as I said, someone could be in a room or in a plaza or in the street of a city and not see the same thing that this other person is, is, is experiencing, right? Um, so with the politics, I don't know, I, I probably didn't answer that question whatsoever. <laughs> but um, what are your thoughts in terms of how you think the politics could actually play a role in? If you understand that a city yeah. is heterotopic, yeah. right? And, uh, and you understand that you know, all those layers, yeah. all these interactions, all that combination that is happening within yourself, yeah. in your space, constantly in flux yeah. and everywhere, not just east-west, but, you know, in every, I mean, we can analyze that in many different Absolutely. ways. Absolutely. Then the idea of um, uh, uh, unilateral identity yeah. cannot exist, right? So the idea that I am this, right, right, and this space should be this, ah, yeah. right, cannot be. Right. Because you understand the fluidity, the you know the in interstices. Uh, yeah, the interstices. Yeah. Interstices. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. 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 These little right. crevices right. and whatnot. Right. Yeah. Where things are, you know, being filled yeah. with so many different identities. Yeah. Right. Um, so in that regard, I think it's a, it, it could be a very, you know, like some concepts that are um, really useful right tools yeah. to um against not only binarity but also against exclusion yeah yeah right yeah without a doubt without a doubt um reaction to marginalizations and whatnot um as a result of laws that are passed the politics that construct the city mm -hmm. itself people's behavior and attitude and actions toward you as well right. that can play a role in mm -hmm. generating those spaces too yeah mm -hmm. yeah Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. how, how our world, um, basically, how we interact with the world and how our world interacts with us. And right. I couldn't help but think of when you said the heterotopic space is both there and not quite there. Yeah. And that, you know, the amalgamation of space and time is disrupted. I yeah. think of the movie Inception. Have you seen it? And that's exactly what it makes me think about. And it, I think it starts with how we view our world yeah. really impacts what actually manifests and how all those things interact. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the movie Inception, it's brilliant. Uh, yeah, but it um, it's, it's a visual literary in itself. And that's kind of how I think about um, when you talk about how, you know, we can suspend time if we chose to. Mm -hmm. We can transform space. We can reconstruct identity. Um, and we can basically reconfigure agency, right? And yeah. recalibrate spaces is what you were addressing. Right, right. Um, I think looking at it from this perspective is actually really refreshing because I feel like it almost creates a safer space to dialogue about what Maricela was bringing up yeah. in a way that is more open to engaging everybody right so thank you yeah absolutely and again I mean people will um, ensure and insist that uh, the world around it the way we perceive it has to follow a certain taxonomy right certain categorization I mean the example of the garden um, that um, uh, uh, Xiaolu uh, Gu's character went through Kew Gardens where she was able to see something that nobody else in the West seemed to have seen However, at the same time, that could have also been deliberate because it's always the idea that it's like, well, they don't know, but at the same time, they don't really care because they're in a position of power anyway. 
So your problem, your situation, your marginalized identity, if it's not going to gel with the dominant culture, you know, it's irrelevant. So a lot of these writers will make spaces, will generate spaces, will identify spaces in that city where they're able to capture that identity, right? And it also is not just on the individual level, it is also on a communal level too. Um, Abulela's characters, particularly in her novel Minaret, you have a, a woman who was, grew up very wealthy, a young, a young lady grew up very wealthy in Khartoum, wore a lot of Western clothes, you know, didn't really keep to Ramadan, but was quote unquote raised Muslim, uh, at least by culture she was. But it isn't until she moves to London that she actually becomes more devout. And um, she decides to wear hijab, she uh, learns uh, more of the, the Quran, she's praying with other you know, women from around the world as well to create the sort of the, the ummah. She's connected to that, the, the universal uh, Muslim community. But she does that in London, so there's a bit of irony that's there too. But she's able to kind of bridge these worlds together and create a third space outside of East and West. So, yeah, yeah um, I have a question because it seems like all the examples are people go to other countries and create this third space right. by, um, you know, um, placing their original ideology from their back countries to this new place. Yeah. So this creates the her heterotypic uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, thing. So yeah. I was curious, um, does that mean if I'm in, the, for example, if I'm in China now, I'm, I have a Chinese ideology, but mm -hmm. I have a different upbringing than other people from China, but I'm kind of also creating this space as well, right? So doesn't necessarily mean I need to go other country or? Oh, no, 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 absolutely okay. not. In fact, um, uh, uh, Gu's other novel, um, Oh, right, right, that's right. Murakami stays within Tokyo to do that. And um, in the other novel by, by, by Gu, she is in Beijing. She moves from the countryside into the city of Beijing where, yeah, exactly, so, and, and in Istanbul. So no, you it doesn't necessarily require actual transmigration. It can be within the city itself where these things are happening to the city. The crisscrossing can take place in the city itself. So for these writers, it's both things. It can be between two cities where they go between. Uh, or it can be within the city itself where the worlds there meet together as well and form those east-west uh, identities for themselves. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's, I was just speaking with Aaron. There are so many other possibilities right now, but these are the ones, the ones that I've done. I've already I've, uh, done research on and I've published some of the things and I've um, taught them in my classes and I'm starting to do some others as well that are connected to these cities. So I try to tie all the classes that I teach into the same conversation so that so it doesn't stop. Because <laughs> it's interesting, for me at least. Um, there's so much that's there. And um, working with the theory itself too, but really trying to understand what the literature is, is doing, it's constantly changing and transforming in and of itself. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it draws me in. Yeah. Um, so I know you're talking about East and West. Yeah. And having this hedral topic, uh, hedral. Heterotopia. Topia world. Yes. Um, my, my thought, my, when I was hearing you speak about it, aren't we living in one already? Itself throughout history, if we look about it, we, uh, from family to you, like, I don't, I feel like it's not new. It, it always has been that way. We just haven't looked at it. That is absolutely right. And that's exactly what Pamuk would say as well. I mean, Istanbul is a perfect example that that city has always been an east-west city. Um, so because of this constant transformation, um, transmigratory process that has always been going on, these ideas, I mean, it's not like they're just suddenly happening all of a sudden. You're right about that. They are always happening. They have always happened. But again, we, at least in the West, we create these binaries. And the separation demonstrates that there really is no fluidity that exists. Something like this says that the fluidity has, is there. And yes, you're right, has always been there. Yeah, so the idea of East-West is not a phenomenon that's suddenly new. Yeah, you're right, though. Absolutely right. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for staying as long as you did. I appreciate it. <laughs>